Question one. What is your understanding of Episcopal ministry? And how will this understanding be reflected in your approach to leadership and ministry? Well, Episcopal ministry. Um, I, I think it's always best to start off with foundations, start off at uh, the ground level. And so I'm always reminded that uh, all ministry for Christians is servant ministry. And, uh, you know, New Testament word diakonia, from which we get our word deacon, but that's the word that describes all that we do. And, of course, that's based in uh, Christ's own words about his own, his own life and service, about he came not to be served, but to serve. So, for me, when I'm thinking about Episcopal ministry, uh, um, the, the, the challenge at times, uh, the special niche that uh, uh, bishops uh, fill, is um, to be uh, a servant to the community while exercising leadership and um, holding authority. And, and coming to do that in a way that shows a clear understanding that we do that uh, as servants of the community of the church and, and of course of, of Christ. So that, that would be my starting point in Episcopal ministry. It's, it's, it's all about servant ministry. Um, and then after that, of course, uh, I just, um, I always like to refer people back to, the, to our prayer books, the services, of ordination services, and that there's all the good stuff in there about being chief pastor, um, that we serve the, uh, the faith, unity, and order of the church, uh, upholding its discipline, um, that we, uh, uh, you know, are primary witnesses to the resurrection and to Christ as Lord and Savior, um, and that, uh, uh, that we are responsible for the administration of the sacraments and, and for the ordering of ministry in the life of the church. And I think it's all important. Um, it's, it's all fundamental and it's the ground from which we build. So. Um, I think it's, the other thing that's important to say about Episcopal ministry is to sort of think for a moment about um, the church, you know, what do, how do we understand the church? And for us as Anglicans, as in most historic churches, um, uh, the, the diocese is the basic unit of the church, you know, the bishop with the clergy and people together as, as community. But the church's life is lived out primarily in the local community, right, where people gather together week by week, and, and we hope more often than that, um, where their lives are shared together, where they uh, worship together, where they study together, and where they engage in work of uh, ministry and outreach in their communities. And, uh, and so, for me, that making that recognition helps to define what a bishop's ministry needs to be about, and that is that it can't be simply about um, standing back at a distance, um, you know, being a policymaker or a CEO. You have to be uh, constantly being engaged with uh, congregation life. Although I prefer to say local community because I think, uh, it, you know, that actually broadens it out a bit because sometimes even congregation parish are words that can make us think of structures that aren't necessarily what we need to look at, but I'll get onto that one later on, of course. Um, so, for me, the Episcopal ministry is about carrying out all that stuff that I said at the beginning, but doing it in a way that is all about uh, enabling, equipping, encouraging um, folks in their life of faith together as Christian communities so that they become healthier places, um, places where the transforming power of Christ are, are known, um, places out of which uh, the church's mission outreach are done. I sometimes like to think of parishes and congregations as missional outposts, you know. And so uh, it's all about um, working with the clergy and lay leaders uh, uh, to provide the kind of enabling and equipping that will help them to do that in a way that really does change and transform parish life. Now, having said that, a good piece of it is also about ordering the common resources that we share and ordering our common life in a way that will enable those things. Um, yeah, so, and, and I guess I would I want to add to that that, um, and maybe this is sort of slightly on the negative side, is that I always think we have to have this healthy skepticism about the ability to be able to initiate uh, policies and programs from a higher level uh, in order to bring life at, at uh, uh, you know, at the, at the ground level. Um, I think that um, while there is a certain measure of that that is possible, that ultimately it has to come about um, by being in touch with, being engaged with, um, working with people, building relationships, and helping people to grow in their own discipleship so that uh, they can carry out the broader mission of the church. So, and that's um, really uh, 
what I try to do on a regular basis. Mm -hmm. Question two. Think about a situation where conflict threatened the unity of the community. What did you do to deal with the conflict? What was the result? How did you deal with unresolved issues? Looking back on this situation, what would you do differently? Well, again, starting with some basic things. Um, I think sometimes we use the word conflict. It's sort of a generic catch-all that describes a whole lot of different things. Um, Conflict in any situation involves unique individuals uh, with different personalities, different characteristics. And in parishes, uh, parishes have personalities and, um, and a certain kind of spirit about them. And so how conflict unfolds and what's behind it is often very different from one place to the next. Um, so for me, uh, when I, for me the first thing always is to, to listen to go in to listen, to, to take stock of, you know, who are, who are the folks who are involved? Um, what's going on? What are the issues? Are there issues of personality at stake? Um, does everybody understand what the conflict is about? Uh, because again, in my experience, sometimes people are in conflict and they're not even fighting about the same thing. Um, they're fighting about completely different things. Um, so listening and then the next stage is to try to bring some understanding on both sides, to bring people together. Uh, to sit down and to say, okay, well, this is what you're saying, and this is what you're saying, you know, do we understand? And, um, and sometimes that in itself can be uh, the piece that uh, brings the conflict to resolution. Um, sometimes, of course, it can't. Sometimes they can come to complete understanding of what they disagree about, and they, in fact, agree that they disagree. And, uh, and then again, the whole issue of personality comes into play yet again. Um, because sometimes people can agree to disagree peaceably and can lay down or lay aside their own particular position um, in compromise or because the community as a whole believes in, a, in, in something that they don't. For other people, it just uh, doesn't seem to be possible to do that, that it's too tight. And so then you have to be able to move forward with a recognition that this is uh, not something that's going to be easily resolved or lived through. So now, you know, the question is about particulars, and, I, and I'm avoiding particulars because I, I just realized that as I was thinking about this, that as soon as you start getting particular, um, somebody somewhere gets to hold of the thing, watches it, and says, wait a minute, he's talking about us, you know, and so I'd, I'd rather not do that. But, you know, keeping, you know, one or two of the particulars in mind, um, I would say that uh, um, sometimes the, the, or in a, in some occasions where there's been conflict, there really has been able to be, come to an understanding, to recognize that people have to lay down things for the greater good, or to recognize that there are more things at stake than they thought there were. I've also um, had situations of conflict where it's quite clear that that's not going to happen, and then there has to be a decision as to how that's going to be resolved, and um, sadly, um, Sadly, uh, the one particular thing that I'm re recalling, um, there needed to be a parting of ways um, where people had to say, well, you know, obviously this can't happen, this can't be this way, this is going to be unhealthy for everybody, and if we can't come to a resolution, then somehow we have to find a way for this to, to sort of move apart. And to me, that's always uh, unfortunate and a failure because reconciliation is at the heart of our ministry, and we, we would expect that we would not have to fall into that. Um, but sometimes it gets there. In terms of what to do then, well, at that point I think it becomes uh, my job as the bishop to be able to say what is the best way forward for this community um, and to try to lead in discussion to say, well, okay, this is the direction we have to take and if somebody can't live with it, then what is a good place we can find for the other person to go so that this is not just a you're out, but where else can we have you be? That, um, that you can continue to uh, walk as a disciple of Jesus and to grow and, and hopefully down the road. Now, in the situations I'm thinking about, um, we have not yet, or perhaps, yeah, we have not yet had a chance to revisit and see if there's a way to, um, to bring those people together, even in their disagreement, and say, okay, you know, bring some peace. Um, there's a sense of peace for the parties on both sides, in, in a certain way, but not the coming together. So 
Um, I think the other pieces that are, are crucial, and I want to mention this one right off the top, is that I always, in these conflicts, urge those who are in conflict to pray for each other. Um, to pray for each other, to pray for God's uh, grace and love upon each, uh, the other, to pray for the good for the other. Um, I think that it's more than magic. <laughs> it is um, about opening our lives and our hearts to the Spirit so that we ourselves can be shaped towards that reconciliation. And I, and I guess the other thing I would say is that if we can step back out of the, um, what's the word I'm looking for, out of the, uh, the tension of the situation and step back from it for a moment and say, you know, in any of these circumstances, there's also here an opportunity to grow deeper in our, in our faith and our discipleship and grow healthier as, uh, as people. Um, then I think that that uh, really provides an opportunity. Question three. The church needs new models for ministry as membership and attendance decline, and we seek to respond to our changing relationship with the world. As bishop, how would you support the desire to renew our life and ministry within the Diocese of Calgary? Well, actually, I, I find that a really exciting question. Um, <clears throat> and for me, it begins with a very simple thing, and it may seem counterintuitive to some people, but that is, um, I have a background in engineering, and one of the things that I took out of my uh, engineering studies was this um, way of thinking about things that when you're confronted with a situation for which the current solutions aren't working, you go back and you say, well, what are we really about? What are we really trying to accomplish? What are the principles that are at stake here? So for, for me as a bishop, I say, well, okay, who are we as the people of God, as disciples of Jesus, as the community of faith? What are we trying to accomplish? And then say, well, instead of trying to replicate again the stuff that hasn't been working, um, what are ways that this can take shape uh, that are both true to who we are and what we're about, and at the same time, um, address the current, current context and situation. And for me, that, that makes it really wonderful because, uh, you know, I, I had a liturgy professor once who said, you know, the bottom line for the Eucharist is a loaf of bread, a bottle of wine, and, uh, and a duly appointed or, or ordained person to, to preside, <laughs> and a Bible to read from. Um, and, uh, and I think that that's, to me, has always stood as an exciting reminder of where you go because, um, there are so many contexts and places where we could be doing, uh, can, well, and are in some cases, but we can be doing so much more simply by saying, how about let's lay aside all the, the stuff, you know, now not for everybody, because sometimes there are congregations that thrive, sometimes for people the, the buildings and all of the, the things that go along with it are a great asset and it helps them to grow. Sometimes in some communities the building becomes a focal place that draws people in and gives them a place to, to come and it gives them a, a missional sign, if you will, for others to see. But there's also a lot of places where we could simply gather people in homes, community halls, wherever, um, gather around the word and sacrament, or even, to begin with, just around gathering to share, to discuss. Um, I'm, I'm really excited about uh, um, the possibilities for that. You know, I, I see, keep seeing this increase in interest in spirituality, and yet people have this kind of vague, kind of looking for anything and everything. And I think, um, and when we think about new forms, is to say, well, what are people looking for? How do we adjust ourselves to hearing what they're hearing without changing the heart of our gospel, without changing what it is that we believe, but rather seeing how, in fact, by God's grace and by the Spirit's leading, we can be true to it and, uh, and reshape ourselves. So, and I think the bishop has a great job in that. One is giving permission, <laughs> giving permission and saying, yeah, you can do that, you can do that. Um, and the other is also helping to give it some stability and form by saying, but you also have to hold on to these things which are, which are at the center. So that for me is uh, Bishop Rule calling us back to ourselves in a way that allows us to be something new for others. Question four. Five years after you have left office as the Bishop of Calgary, how would you like people in the diocese to remember your episcopacy? What legacy do you hope to leave the diocese? Well, I, I have to say, I always uh, think that I hope that after five years they're not talking about me, but they're talking about <laughs> they're talking about the wonderful ministry that's going on and about the life that they share in community and about their ongoing discipleship. Um, uh, if I was going to have to name something about a legacy, I would say uh, 
Well, I think it would flow out of what I said in the last question is, to, is have people have a sense that they have been drawn deeper into their walk as disciples of Jesus in a way that allows them to express that in a fresh way in their community and, and have some courage and boldness and confidence in being able to live that um, in their neighborhood, in their workplace, before their friends in a way that is generous, that is kind and humil humble, but at the same t time um, clear and, um, and confident about the gospel message. So that would be it. Yeah.